the soil are depleting topsoil at more than 10 times the rate that Mother Nature can replenish it. The transportation of food for hundreds and sometimes even thousands of miles creates more carbon, which is spewed into the atmosphere. What is sometimes called the standard American diet, or SAD, <laughs> which promotes the heavy consumption of convenience foods that are highly processed and the excessive consumption of foods which are highly concentrated in refined sugars, high consumption of meat and dairy products, is responsible for high rates of diabetes, childhood and adult obesity, and heart disease. Those diseases appear even more frequently in communities that don't have good access to high-quality food. There are many intersecting, intersecting factors that cause this inequity in the food system, including geography and economic class. But one of the huge factors is racism. There continues to be a global system of white supremacy that gives favor and unearned privilege to people who are identified as white. It makes white people the norm and marginalizes the experiences of people of African descent and other people of color. It creates structural barriers to inequity. A good definition of white supremacy appears in the Dismantling Racism workbook published by a group called DR Works. They define white supremacy as the idea that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. The global system of white supremacy is anchored in a worldview that suggests that white people are the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> this Eurocentric worldview causes people around the world to be falsely taught that Greece and Rome are the fountainheads of human civilization, that classical culture is synonymous with Western European culture, and that Jesus, Mary, and presumably God are all white. In much of the world, we continue to name the days of the week after European deities such as Wooden and Thor. Let's be clear, race is not a scientific reality. Race is a social and political construct, and it has at times been bolstered by pseudoscience, by religion, and by the military. The concept of racial identity has evolved many times in the United States. An early American definition of whiteness was that an individual did not have one drop of black or Native American blood. Conversely, 19th century Southern law suggested that one drop of black blood made you a so-called Negro. Even though race is not a scientific reality, as a social construct, it continues to have major impact on every institution in American society and in all of the systems in America, including the food system. If it's true that land is the basis of power, then land ownership in America tells a profound story about the intersection of race and power. In 1910, blacks owned more than 15 million acres of farmland. By 1992, that number had dropped to 2 million. According to the USDA's 1999 study on agricultural economics and land ownership, whites own 98% of the privately owned farmland in America, and blacks, Native Americans, Latinos, and Asians collectively own the other 2%. One of the issues that I'm particularly passionate about is the almost colonial style extraction of wealth from black communities. Food is one of the foundational building blocks of a local economy. The economic potential of black communities continues to be siphoned off, either by African Americans having to leave our communities in search of stores that sell high quality food, or by spending the money in our own communities with merchants who don't live in the neighborhoods and don't invest in the well-being of the community. Malcolm X spoke to this 50 years ago in his famous speech titled The Ballot or Bullet, delivered in Detroit. Malcolm said, even when we try to spend our money in the block where we live or in the area where we live, we're spending with a man who, when the sun goes down, takes that basket full of money in another part of town. What about workers in the food system? The report, The Color of Food, 
published in 2011 by the Applied Research Center, teaches us that throughout the food chain, whites earn more than people of color, including in production, processing, retail and service, and distribution. People of color tend to be concentrated in low-wage jobs and hold few management positions in the food system. Access to quality food is limited in many black communities throughout the United States. In my hometown, Detroit, with a population of roughly 700,000, only one national grocery store uh, exists in the approximately 140 square miles of the city. And that's Whole Foods, which opened last year in a highly gentrified area of the city. It's the only national chain store to open in Detroit since 2007, when Farmer Jack closed the last of its Detroit stores. According to the Fair Food Network, based in Ann Arbor, there are currently about 10 grocery stores for every 100,000 people in Detroit. That's a sharp contrast to nearby Ann Arbor, where there are nearly twice that number. Of the 70 or so independently owned grocery stores in the city of Detroit, many sell inferior quality produce and often don't have other healthy food options. Even in the burgeoning food movement that seeks to create a more just food system, we see racism rearing its ugly head. Far too often, well-funded, white-led nonprofits come into black and Latino communities to plant gardens, teach cooking or nutrition, or lead food justice efforts. While on the surface, such efforts may appear to be noble, these groups far too often approach their work like missionaries, assuming that they know what's best for the communities in which they do their work. The thing about the system of white supremacy is that it's so entrenched in the fabric of American society that we all unwittingly play into it regardless of our intentions. None of us escapes the impact of the system of white supremacy. Black people and other people of color are afflicted with what is sometimes called internalized racial oppression. Because of centuries of messaging and actions that suggest that our history, culture, and even our bodies have little value, we often have a diminished view of ourselves that impedes us from collectively addressing the problems faced by our community. Both those who identify as white and those who identify as black or people of color have work to do to rid ourselves of these antiquated notions that continue to dominate the deepest parts of our mind. So what must be done to create a food system that's an example of the racial justice and equity that we envision in the society that we strive to bring into being? A good first step is acknowledging and intentionally working against the system of white supremacy. This includes doing the personal transformative work to rid ourselves of the false concepts that we've internalized. This work is most effectively done by meeting regularly in caucuses where whites study support and hold each other accountable for ridding themselves of concepts of superiority. And blacks and other people of color study, support, and hold each other accountable for ridding themselves of concepts associated with inferiority. It also includes working to change institutional policies and practices that uphold systemic racism. The imposition of emergency managers in the state of Michigan has tremendous racial implications. Debates about federal immigration policy are highly racially charged. The courageous young activists in Ferguson, Missouri, have recently focused the world's attention on the policies and practices that criminalize black youth. Both types of work, the personal transformation and working for broader systemic change, are greatly aided by participating in in-depth, multi-day anti-racist training. Anti-racist trainings are not the same as diversity training or cultural sensitivity training. Anti-racist training seek to fundamentally challenge a deep-rooted system of oppression. There are groups right here in the state of Michigan that, and throughout the country that do an excellent job of trainings that help us to gain a better understanding of the concept of whiteness and how it intersects with class and power. The ideas driving the food movement have gained tremendous traction over the last decade or so. Each month there are dozens of conferences, workshops, and forums throughout the country focusing on urban agriculture, food policy, 
healthy food access or nutrition. Conversations and actions addressing racial equity should be an integral part of each of those food gatherings. Social justice organizations, community empowerment institutions, and thought leaders have the responsibility of developing and implementing strategies to identify, lift up, and support people of color leading grassroots food security and food justice work in communities throughout the country. Organizations and institutions doing work to create food justice should redouble their efforts to hire African Americans and other people of color, particularly in executive positions, and to appoint people of color to their boards. It's imperative that those who are most impacted by food insecurity and food injustice have agency to change the conditions in their communities rather than being subjects who are simply acted upon by others. Funders have a tremendous role to play. They should require that nonprofits receiving funding adopt and use a racial equity lens in all aspects of their work, including adopting community engagement strategies that acknowledge the existing community leadership and that seek to promote community self-determination. We don't need white people to save us or to fix us. We don't need missionaries. We do need leadership that grows organically from our communities. We have the responsibility of shifting the narrative about the food movement, and so we have to ask ourselves whose voices are being heard and whose images are being projected. Here are some extraordinary and awesome, I might say, food movement leaders that you should know about. This is Jenga Mwendo, who leads the Backyard Gardeners Network in the Katrina ravaged Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. She's utilizing community gardening as a way of galvanizing her community to envision what could exist. They're using gardening as a tool to bring people together to make the community more beautiful and beneficial. Meet Cynthia Hayes, the executive, executive director of SAFON, the Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network. She has organized more than 120 black organic farmers in the southeast part of the United States and recently began a Caribbean initiative based in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands to train farmers in the Caribbean to receive organic certification. Here's Angela Green, who founded the Salt of the Earth Youth Market Garden in her neighborhood in Kansas City, Kansas. This garden brings vibrancy to a struggling community and offers young people a way to make money while addressing the lack of access to good food in their community. Finally, this is my friend Alufami Lewis, the co-founder of the Ujamaa Mobile Market in Asheville, Tennessee, excuse me, Asheville, North Carolina. Under her leadership, a converted truck delivers fresh, healthy, locally grown produce to neighborhoods in Asheville with few healthy food options. Food is a great unifier because everybody eats, regardless of race, class, religion. The food movement has the potential to model the justice and equity that we desire to bring about in all segments of society. This will, however, require that white people humble themselves in order to learn from the rich cultural traditions of black, brown, red, and yellow people. It's my belief that the values embedded in many indigenous cultures are what will be needed to pull humanity from the brink of disaster. Those active in the struggle for food security, food justice, and food sovereignty must work to dismantle the system of white supremacy if we are to create a food system in which access to high quality, fairly and sustainably grown, clean food is upheld as a human right. The reality is that these issues are interconnected. Social justice is a prerequisite for food sovereignty. The great revolutionary thinker, Frantz Fanon, in his classic book, The Wretched, Wretched of the Earth, instructed us that, quote, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. This is our time. Let's act in a manner which will make future generations proud. Thank you so much.